so much misunderstood regarding that one word. Grace meaning unashamed, undeserved love and favor upon those who deserve it the least. That is why we invite family, friends, community to discover grace on this Sunday and once a month. That is why we give those of you who are part of our church, we give you the opportunity to have copies of Discover Grace messages because grace is so compelling. If our forgiveness, if our righteousness, perceived righteousness or legitimate righteousness, rested in us alone, there would be not much a compelling for religion. In fact, I'm here to tell you this morning that I can say with all my heart and with all the assurance possible within me that if my righteousness rested upon my work, my strength, my ability, this truly would be a waste of time. Because we know we can't do it enough. We know there's not enough. When are we ever, ever going to be able to say we deserve God's grace? When are we ever going to be able to say we deserve God to forgive me for my sin? The way a lot of people in the world deal with that is just to deny the idea of sin. Well, I can get past this lack of forgiveness by thinking I don't need forgiveness. Romans chapter 1 is very clear that we know in our heart of hearts that we are sinners. And we know there is a God who has revealed himself in our conscience, who has revealed himself in creation, who has revealed himself and then ultimately in the person of Jesus Christ and has showed us, first of all and foremost in our lives, we need God's grace. It is no more a crutch to rely upon the grace of God than it is to rely upon man's understanding and reasoning. Really, if we have, every one of us here has a God that we serve and we worship. Be it the God revealed to us through creation, our conscience and the word of God, or the God of our own minds and our own intellect, our own understanding, we do have a God. We do have something we rely upon, some place we seek for truth, some place we seek for that respite and forgiveness and grace. We look for grace in others. We look for grace in organizations. And some people look for grace in church, in religion. But the reality is that compelling grace, grace that covers the extent of our sin, grace that is far greater than the immensity of my failure, can only be found in the supernatural, infinite God of the Bible. It's the only place that grace can be found. That is the truth of God's Word. And that is why we exist as individuals. And Jesus, He came to this earth, the Son of God, God the Son in the flesh. He came and He revealed Himself the carrier of grace. The ultimate person of grace. Because He loved us, God sent His Son into this world. John 3.16 tells us that. The extent of the love of God is so immense and unearned that it is impossible for us to fully grasp and understand. I don't think there is any person alive who could understand the grace as God has revealed it in its fullness. Because I have to come to myself. Every time I have one of these Discover Grace Sundays and I preach about grace, I come to myself and I say, Why me? Why would you show grace to me? It's the song we just heard. Why would you whisper, it is I, to me? Why me? I think this parable found in Luke chapter 7, this woman who was a known sinner had that same question she probably asked in her mind. Why me? What you have here in Luke chapter 7 in this parable that Jesus tells a short little two-sentence parable surrounded by a larger context. And with the larger context, what you have is you really have two kinds of people being described here. Two kinds of people that both owe a debt. One is forgiven, one is not. Jesus tells this parable 
to this person, Simon, who does not believe Jesus is the Messiah. He does not believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He does not believe that Jesus will forgive sins. And that's why he thinks within himself, if this man were a prophet... The hypocrisy of Simon the Pharisee that we read, as he says, when Jesus lets this sinful, known sinful woman touch his feet with her hair and the tears and wipe his feet with ointment, with this, the play on words, as, as Simon says, if this man were a prophet, he would know what manner of this woman was. And the reality is, Jesus was more than a prophet. He knew who this woman was. And so he responds without Simon even saying anything out loud and says, Simon, I have something to tell you. <laughs> demonstrating he was a prophet. He didn't know exactly what Simon was thinking. Simon didn't voice his opposition. Instead, in his hypocrisy, he says, Master, say on. Jesus was no more Simon's master than the devil. See, Simon had never submitted himself to Jesus Christ. He'd never submitted himself to God. Evidently, this woman had. And here we have the two persons. Uh, just explain a little bit this morning as we go through this, this parable, the, the background around it, and look at grace, the grace of God, the grace and responsibility seen in the teaching of this parable. Uh, the setting here. This is a human story with a spiritual intent, right? A parable is a story with intent. We've been looking at these recently. This parable explains the basics of grace, mercy, love, and forgiveness. Feasting was a very important part of the hospitality in New Testament Jewish culture. Actually, all of the culture around that time frame. Feasting is big. Almost anything was an excuse to feast. Maybe they have a lot in common with Baptists. I'm not sure. Uh, anything. We get an excuse to feast here. Much of the work in those days was monotonous. And you didn't have diversions like we have today. Oh, to live in the day when we didn't have all the wonderful technologies that we have today. Well, they diverted, they diverted our attention away from things. Well, these people didn't have those diversions. So what did they do? She's so deeply aware of her sin, she won't even speak to Jesus, but simply wipe his feet and cry. And Simon is so arrogant in his sin, he criticized Jesus under his breath, and then says, Master... Say on. And so we have the contrast of these two individuals. One broken in humility who then breaks out her best and just does what she can to worship. And the other stubborn and strong and unwilling to admit their sin. And so Jesus turns to Simon and tells him a little story. That's where we come in with the parable. A certain man, a certain moneylender, creditor, had two guys who owed him debt. Two debtors. The one owed approximately a year's worth of wages. The other owed approximately a day's worth of wages. The beautiful part about this parable is 42 when he says, and when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Frankly, it means completely. He released them. He didn't hold it against them. He didn't set up a payment plan. They didn't have to work for the payment. He simply forgave them. And then he asks, that, that's the end of the story. I mean, talk about a story without an ending. That's it. That's the story he tells. Forgave them. Their debt's done. They're gone. No more payment. But he directs this to Simon, doesn't he? He, turned, he directs it to Simon. He's, this is who he's telling the parable to. And he says, Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most. Now, this is a pretty easy answer, too, isn't it? You put yourself in the shoes of this creditor. I mean, that's not too hard to do in our American society today, to put ourselves in the shoes of a debtor, <laughs> owing some money, owing some, ha having a creditor, and feeling the pressure of those credit card bills, or feeling the pressure of that car payment, that house payment, those things. And then just picture yourself having it all released. It's all gone. I mean, Simon is compelled to answer the way he does. Human reasoning will not allow him to answer any other way. That's the beauty of the parable of Jesus.